Welcome to Plugged Inland. I'm Roger Bowman. On this episode, we're looking at injuries that result from your children's participation in sports. Every day, numerous kids leave the field of play with some degree of soreness or an outright problem. Today, we'll learn what you can do as a parent to minimize the likelihood of injuries and to improve the recovery process when one does occur. This is your chance to ask questions of a surgeon. So take advantage of this live broadcast and call or email now. For many kids, sports is the path to acceptance, both by their peers and hopefully by colleges wielding scholarships. So it's no surprise kids are beginning at a younger age. My name is uh, Jerry Mason. I'm the head coach of the TJ Striders Youth Track and Field Club here at San Bernardino Valley College. Uh, my name is Derek Matthews and I'm the assistant head coach for the TJ Striders Youth Track and Field Club. I've been working with Coach Jerry for about 14 years. The kids I coach, we train these kids here to run in the Junior Olympics, and that's nationwide. We coach a different age group of kids uh, from seven years old all the way up to 17 year olds, high school age kids. Um, they're all doing the same type of thing, but different workouts as the, as the age group goes along. I've been running for three years. When I run fast, it makes me like get in shape. I, I'm, I stay in shape still when I play other sports. I, I played football, basketball. I've been running for one year. I've been running for four years. Um, I started running because people told my dad to put me in track. I started running because everybody told me I was fast and I was the fastest in my class. Um, I hurt my heel and my knee, and that's it. I've, um, I've hurt my heel, too. I had to wear a cast for a week. I had to wear a brace and a cast for six weeks. I've been running for five years. I have been running for three years. I wanted to do running so I can get faster for football. My mom got me into running because my other brothers ran for this track team. I've been running for three years. Now I've been running for six years. Yes, I um, have a, like occurring shin splints and that happens a lot. And my knee, it tends to hurt a lot like when I do longer distance. Uh, a year and then I took a year off and I came back. I ran for three years and I took three years off and I came back. Because I felt like I needed to get faster again. I started running because my dad and told me that I was fast and I told him if I could track. I hurt my knee in the long jump. Um, I took a couple of years off and iced my knee. I've been running for one month. I like running for TJ Striders because it's very competitive and I like my teammates because they're nice and I love the coaches because they are very inspirational and they will help me get better and better to going to the Olympics. Well, I like coaching because it, it gives the kids a feel for what track and field is all about. It also gives them a head start when they get to high school on how to run correctly and do the things they need to do to be successful in track and field. I, I just love it because I, I, I started off co uh, running track at a young age, so I just like to bring back some of the stuff that I learned from years ago and just trying to help these kids stay out of the streets and better themselves, show them that there's a better way of life. I'm pleased to be joined by two orthopedic surgeons specializing in sports injuries, Dr. Christopher Job and Dr. Hassan Sayad. Both practice at the Loma Linda University Medical Center. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. So we saw in the opening those adorable young girls talking about their injuries one had an injury to the heel and a brace and the other to the knee and the heel, I think it was. So is that a common thing that you see in your practice? I would say it is. Uh, not as common as some of the more severe injuries, but children at that age have growth plates and it's a layer of cartilage in the bone where we're growing. And there's one that, at the heel that is especially prone to getting injured and one at the knee. And this never has to be operated on. 
it uh, recovers with rest and time. We call it apophysitis, but it's an inflammation of a growth plate. And you notice both girls took a relatively short period of time, one, one week and the other six weeks, and they were able to return to sports. So yeah. that type of injury you will recover from. So that's something that is just an inevitable outcrop of getting into it that young. Yes, and, and overuse. Uh, my own nephew had this. Um, he decided he was going to use his pogo stick 400 times in one day to set some sort of record, and he couldn't get out of bed the next morning. Uh, but yet he recovered in a matter of weeks. So Hassan, let me ask you, going for the Junior Olympics is a worthy endeavor, but now it seems like we're more aggressive as a society trying to bring our kids to sports earlier and earlier to make them excel and possibly get a college scholarship or turn pro. Are you seeing that as a trend or has it always been there and it's just more public lately? No, it, there definitely is a trend towards going earlier and earlier just for the fact that the earlier you start, the more practice you're going to get, the more experience and therefore you'll be more competitive when it comes time to making it to the elite level. Isn't but that a good thing? That, that is a good thing at a you know, low level in that kids are more active and they're more uh, outdoors, but at another level, uh, sort of like how we heard the interviews talk about, injuries are occurring and they're repetitive injuries. And uh, just like Dr. Job talks about in clinic, repetitive injuries occur with tissues that are used, overused, and if time isn't allowed, they don't heal. So it is something we see, but you know, we do see that kids are able to heal most of these injuries. So Chris, you mentioned growth plates. What are growth plates and do they stop growing and just become an adult plate? Uh, exactly. You can look on your x-rays and we can see a little line of bone where your growth plate used to be. Well now it's stronger. It's actually a stronger piece of the bone. But in the child it's made out of cartilage. The shiny stuff you see on the end of a chicken bone, it's not a very strong material. And so you can you can overload it. There's, there's two ways you can overload it. One is doing the activity incorrectly. And people have studied young pitchers, 12, 13, 14, and none of them is throwing correctly. We used to beat up on the little league coaches, well, don't let them throw this or don't let them throw that. Everybody has their own natural way of throwing, but none of it is correct. So you don't want them doing it too much, which is the second way you get an overuse injury, is to, uh, you're playing for the little league, the little league coach limits your number of pitches and the games, and then when he's not looking, you go across town and you play for another team that's not in the little league. And the little league coach doesn't know that you're doing that. And then you play all year long, the same sports. You're not, that one child was talking about, well, I play basketball, and then I play baseball, and then I play football. He's varying the tissues that he's stressing by changing his emphasis. And the other child said, I want to learn to run faster because it'll help me with football. He's changing his sport. He's changing the stresses he puts on his body. And hopefully somebody's telling him, do this for fun. Don't do it too much. So I'm going to change subjects a little bit. Hassan, tell me a little bit about what got you into sports medicine. Well, growing up, I loved sports. And as I got into high school, I kind of was more focused on science. And the combination sort of uh, evolved into medical school and then heading towards orthopedics and uh, still being interested in sports, but now seeing it from the medical perspective, um, it sort of brought me into the subspecialty of sports medicine within this field. So we'll get into the injuries in a little bit, but just off the top, give me kind of a ballpark number. Uh, how many kids that you treat recover fully and go on to continue playing sports? And how, for how many is it, um, if not debilitating, it's at least sports ending? The vast majority of kids actually heal, and that's the great thing about being a kid. Their tish, the tissues that kids have that injure have the ability to heal themselves. So if I had to put a ballpark figure, I would say 95 to 99 percent of kids will heal most of their injuries if treated appropriately, if recognized. Um, there are those cases where there are injuries to the cartilage, to the joint surface of the particular injured part. And when that happens, there can be instances where it can change the child's ability to go on to sports at a higher level. We were talking about the continuity, the ability to go back into the sports, and you just mentioned a number that startled me. 
95 to 98 percent of the kids can go on playing, which really tells me that as a parent, it's okay to throw my kid in and have them do the overuse injuries and everything else because, frankly, our medicines of the caliber that, man, eh, they'll bounce back, man up, take the injury, get your surgery, and you'll be fine. I should back up then. It really <laughs> depends on the type of injury. So, and the sort of kind of what we heard from uh, the interviews, the track and field type, the overuse, the stress injuries, those are injuries where there's no surgeries that is required and they will heal. When you get to the higher level and you're seeing more dramatic injuries, ACL tears, rotator cuff injuries, uh, ligament injuries, and you're starting to require surgeries, I, I would then say the numbers change. But the number of athletes who get injured and fall into that category versus the big picture where all kids play at some level, that's where I would say the vast majority do fine. And I don't want to scare kids into not wanting to play. It's much better to play than to sit and be in front of a video game. But that being said, um, I think I would have to break down injuries into the type that heal on their own and the type that require surgery, which by definition is a more severe kind. But you're a surgeon. Right. So you mostly see the more severe. Right. So when patients come to Dr. Job or myself, they're coming not for the fact that they're going to have to have surgery, but they've reached the point where surgery is on the table. And I would still say that as a sports surgeon, the vast majority of the time we want to actually treat injuries that can be treated without surgery as much as possible because um, with surgery, it's, you're going to not have a perfect outcome all the time. Whereas the body does have a pretty remarkable ability to heal itself short of major ligament injuries. It's the, think about the time experience. If you come in with this irritated insertion on your knee and I get your parents to pull back on what you're trying to do or you have a, an injury to your arm, an overuse injury, and we cut back on the number of pitches you throw and get you to a pitching coach um, so that you get appropriate style and decrease the amount that you're throwing, you see me maybe once, twice, but if on the other hand you've torn your anterior cruciate ligament, then you see me, you get an MRI, because that's too deep. I can't do that with ultrasound. They, they come back and then we schedule your surgery and then I repair you with a graft and you come back at two weeks for a wound check and then you go to the physical therapist for a month and you come back and then another month of physical therapy and you come back. It's nine months before we even think about you going back to football or soccer. So if you counted the number of patients, 95% of them get well without surgery, but if you counted them by clinic visits, 50% of them uh, have trouble going back to sport because a surgery is an investment of a year in your life. Would you say that year knocks people out of contention for, say, college scholarship positions? Oh, absolutely, because I've got to have the surgery and back, be back in a month because the scouts are coming. Well, we're not that good. We can't restore that. Chris, you happened to mention the ultrasound, and you chuckled about the MRI and the difference between the MRI and the ultrasound. For our audience, tell us a little bit about the innovation of ultrasound used as a diagnostic tool. Well, ultrasound has been used for decades by the obstetricians, and they bounce sound. It's like the, the submarine movies where the sonar is bounced off a solid object and it comes back. So obstetric obstetricians can look at babies and tell if there are deformities or if there's a heart problem. In orthopedics, it's, it started in Germany and it was largely sh shoulder surgeons. And we can look at the rotator cuff with a high degree of accuracy. And on the field, trainers, after, after an injury, they can look at the collateral ligaments of the knee if they're trained in, in a high degree of accuracy. So you get a quality of picture that is as good or better than the MRI at about 20% of the cost. Did I just hear you correctly that it can be used in the field as a diagnostic tool right on the side of the play field? Yes, because your knee ligaments are right under the skin. And the accuracy of an ultrasound is higher the closer you are to the skin. If you think about your knee, you have a layer of skin, a thin layer of fat, and then all the ligaments and tendons. So for these peripheral knee injuries, it's the ideal place, or finger injuries, or the rotator cuff, something deep like a cruciate ligament, 
we're not that good yet uh, for visualizing that. The angle of the ligament is wrong, it's too deep, the frequency we have to use. But for some things, it's as good or better. I think some things, I, I, it's better than MRI. No kidding. Are there innovations in the surgical techniques themselves? Tell me a little bit about microsurgery. Um, well, one area I would kind of consider microsurgery within sports is for cartilage repair. Uh, it's sort of cutting edge. It's kind of um, trying to fill the pothole on the road surface. That's sort of the analogy I give for a cartilage injury to a joint surface. Um, if there's a pothole of cartilage missing, we can actually go in and using microscopic sutures, put a membrane and inject cartilage cells back. And it's actually more applicable to younger patients and you, you, you wouldn't think of doing something like that for somebody over 40. You talk to them more about replacing the joint with metal and plastic. But that's where microsurgery would sort of apply to sports, but that's really at the periphery. Um, most of what we're doing is arthroscopic, which is uh, what people may think of as microscopic, but it's making small incisions, putting a camera inside, and trying to do things minimally invasively. Walk me through that. A, a sure. typical procedure was I'm guessing here, 20 years ago, open surgery. Right. You pull back the skin and you have everything exposed and you operate in traditional fashion. Right, so uh, that's a great question because it really segues into what sports medicine is for the orthopedist, which the vast majority of it is doing surgery in a minimally invasive fashion. Where it came about was because injuries led to downtime, athletes wanted to get back as fast as possible. So if you did a surgery where you had a large exposure, you're cutting skin, muscle, and exposing what you need to work on, well now all those layers have to heal, and therefore that's that much time that you need for rehabbing that injury and getting back to play. Fast forward and add the camera, and now all of a sudden you just have to make an incision that's a third of an inch. You stick your camera in, and now you can see everything and now make a couple more incisions and now you can stick in instruments where you can now put in what you needed to. Um, most commonly say an ACL tear where we're gonna make a ligament by making these small tears and now the athlete's able to get back faster. And so, is that how you normally operate? Yeah, that's sort of what our training is. And Chris, you, you as well? That's the, the majority, I followed, as I came up in the days before arthroscopy, and when we started doing arthroscopy, it was for diagnosis. You would look in the knee to make sure what you thought was there was there, and then you would open up the knee. And then people said, well, we're going into this person's knee to remove something. We're not m reconstructing. We're taking out a piece of meniscus or a loose piece of cartilage floating around. Why don't we do that? So the destructive procedures were invented. And then well, you know, we do these anterior cruciate ligament reconstructions. Maybe we can do this with the arthroscope. And what happened was that the procedure mutated. Because you're looking through a little tiny camera and blowing it up on a big television screen, we're talking about making adjustments of a millimeter in where we're putting the ligament, where you, wouldn't, you would never dream of doing that open. And then with numbers of people doing arthroscopy, you started to describe diseases that people didn't know existed before. You hear about baseball players have a slap lesion. Well, that was described in 1990. Well, prior to that, it was an unknown entity. It's just that there are a number of doctors looking in the shoulders of throwers said started to see the same thing. And so it, it takes on a life of its own. So would you say that procedure for the surgeon is more difficult or does it make surgery easier? It depends at what level of training you are. At the outset, when we train our residents, <clears throat> arthroscopy is a lot more difficult than open surgery. Open surgery, you're looking at where you're operating, you're putting your hands where you need to operate and there's no hand-eye coordination beyond what you're seeing. With arthroscopy, there's a pretty steep learning curve because now there's three factors. You're looking at a screen, but your hands are working elsewhere. And secondly, you don't have as many degrees of motion as you would with an open field, meaning you can only move in certain positions. And the final thing that sort of makes arthroscopy a little bit more difficult is in the joints, we're looking at curved st structures. So we're trying to look around corners. So the cameras we use are actually angled. Um, so we'll find our training, uh, when we're training residents, residents sort of leaning side to side just because 
they're disoriented and you will have a room full of assistants who are getting <coughs> seasick because of all the motion on the screen. But once you get beyond that, then, and you see the patients come back and you see the benefits of what minimally invasive surgery does to recovery, um, I, I would now consider it much easier than open surgery. I don't know. It is. And, and it's frustrating for people who are learning because one of the residents today I said, well, you did a great job. He says, yeah, but you, you make it look like Hungry Hungry Hippo, which I've never seen. It's apparently it's a children's game where you, you press this thing and the, yes. the hippopotamuses uh, come out and bite something. He says, you make it look like Hungry Hungry Hippo. <laughs> uh. Now, we have a couple of questions I'm going to get to in just a moment. But first I want to say, you mentioned, Hassan, that the residents find it a little disorienting. It's not like penmanship where you have that eye-hand coordination. But I would give the analogy it's more like watching a child in front of a video game with a controller. There's these arrows and analog sticks that move figures on the screen and they aren't moving an actual object like if the character for instance is turning a gun you know to in a shoot sure. first person shooter game. Um, they're just using their fingers on a controller that's below them while never looking at it. it. Is it that kind of a learning curve where they get that level of expertise? Uh, it is. It's similar to that. And in fact, some studies show that actually residents who've played more video games have a faster learning curve than those who have it. Um, the only differences are we have to, have to control the body part while we're sort of looking at the screen. So in a video game, you, you have a stationary situation where you're moving the controller, whereas in arthroscopy, one hand, actually every part of your body is doing something. Your hand is holding the camera. The other hand is actually positioning another instrument. Your foot's actually controlling the pedals, and the other foot is probably balancing the patient's leg. So you're an advanced drummer. Yeah, <laughs> well, I would or, actually or say organist. more. Yeah, I would say that's more uh, accurate. And there are people working on computer games to simulate the arthroscopic experience, where they're trying to make the, the force that, while you're playing the game, feels like an arthroscopic instrument and that you're looking at things and they're that's amazing yeah let me jump out to a it. question by email and i just want to remind our viewers this is live and you can ask questions of these ortho surgeons so if you have kids that have been injured or you suspect that they may be on the road to injury because they're playing too hard call now or email let's go to a question from susie of san bernardino what is the most in uh, common type of injury for sports kids That's a pretty broad question. Good, let me narrow it to quarterbacks. Quarterbacks, um, I would say two body parts, shoulder and knee. Shoulder from just the fact that they're throwing the ball all the time, and knees from what the defensive side of the ball is doing to them when they get tackled. Um, so Because they're always eclipsed from the side? They're, get, they're not seeing the defender, they're looking down the field for their receivers, and they're getting hit usually and they're not expecting the hit. So that's usually where the knee injuries come back. It's a lateral clipping type injury. Or that, or they step on their own linemen as they're falling backwards. I've actually, I, I've never considered that for a quarterback, the fact that the knee is so vulnerable compared to say the tackle of an ordinary running back or a receiver who may be situationally aware, who right. may understand who's the defender, the cornerback is right next to them. If you look at the NFL, a lot of the penalties are uh, geared towards protecting the quarterback because it's such a vulnerable position. They're having to actually focus their attention from being tackled to what they need to do on the offensive side. And at the same time, they have 11 guys coming at them trying to take them down. And so that's where their knee injuries are commonly occurring is because they're not able to protect themselves. And you mentioned the shoulder. I would have thought like a baseball player would be the popping of the elbow as they throw the ball. Uh, well, part of it is the motion. It's an overhead motion. They're not really trying to put any spin on the ball or curve the ball. And half the time, the defender is coming at them also at th that time as they throw it. And so I've seen a lot of shoulder injuries, such as dislocations, um, shoulder rotator cuff strains. Uh, luckily, in that age group, the rotator cuff tends to be really thick, so you don't tend to see the tears we see in the older population. But... Um, that's the two areas I see. Yeah, it's a, a, the throwing injuries are unusual in the quarterbacks. It's, it's an indirect injury. Somebody is shoving your elbow back and you get a secondary injury to your shoulder. It's not so much from the throwing, it's from 
defending yourself or after the throw. Let's take a moment and go over some of the sports that are out there and rate for me, if you will, what the degree of risk is for a more permanent debilitating injury. Uh, first, you've mentioned football, so let's start with football. High risk or is there enough padding and protection that it's, it's fairly mitigated? High risk. It's a high risk. Uh, of, of all the sports I see, um, if I have to go through the three major sports, basketball, football, and baseball, and I, I think I should throw in soccer just because that's a pretty big youth sport, um, I would definitely put football at the top of the list, not just because of the injuries we see with ligaments, but head injuries, that, which is sort of the big topic where everybody from the NFL, college football, high school football is focusing on. And getting to the second part of your question about the equipment, um, really talking about more towards the head injuries, the helmets that are in play now, they've been designed more to protect the skull from fracture than to protect the brain from the shear injury that occurs, i.e. concussion. We're going to cover concussions in a little bit. Um, you mentioned baseball. There are injuries associated with baseball, though. Sure. And uh, I would say that baseball injuries tend to fall into the more overused category. Yeah. And the most common one, as we'll probably talk about, is pitchers, little league pitchers and little league elbows and the overused phenomena that comes from that. Do you recommend the Tiger Woods approach of dad getting the boy to pitch at a very young age, four years old, learning how to throw that curveball? <laughs> that sort of opens up a can of worms. Um, you know, one of the problems with uh, Little League is they want to do what they see on TV, what the major leaguers are doing, and sort of throwing that curveball is kind of a goal of a lot of pitchers and Little Leaguers alike. The only problem is their bodies aren't designed for what they want to attempt. And um, a lot of the elbow injuries that occur, especially trying to throw a curveball, slider, breaking pitch, they're putting ligaments at risk that aren't ready to actually handle that type of stress. And I'm sure Dr. Job could speak to that. Yeah, and then there's the brain. Uh, the studies doing high-speed photography of children throwing, and none of them are throwing correctly. So the the energy of the throw. When you throw, you generate the force by falling toward the catcher. Um, basically, running is a forward fall. You're catching yourself every step. The throw is the same thing. You're falling toward the catcher, and then you take that energy that you've generated by falling, direct it, about a third of it, into the ball, and then you dissipate that energy by a follow-through motion. You become a falling object again over the opposite foot. If you're not doing it correctly, you can get uh, an overuse injury at a much lower level of use. So I would say to parents, make it fun because you're trying to get them to do too much to train the brain. The brain won't accept that information. They are not mature enough to make the, the necessary moves. And let them have fun so that they'll want to keep doing it. And then you can overwork them when they're 17 or 18. And a simpler message really <coughs> to also let the kids know is listen to your body. I mean, if there is pain, you know, listen to it. It's your body trying to tell you something's not right, something needs rest. And that's sort of the dilemma that occurs when parents are pushing kids to achieve at a high level and the kids are pushing past that signal. And that's really uh, a point at which you can cross the point of no return. I Th thought of another sport, yeah. dangerous, for women. It was ice hockey. When, remember when they, they surveyed all of the concussions? Women's ice hockey was, I think, three times all the other sports, men and women. There's Coaches a lot of collision. have to be more and more aware of the status of their team members. Let's take a look at one of the coaches and how he addresses the issue of injuries on his team. My name is Mike Sola. I'm a certified athletic trainer by the National Athletic Trainers Association and I'm the head athletic trainer at San Bernardino Valley College. It varies on the sport. I would say, you know, basketball, you have sprained ankles. Uh, football, 
a lot of contusions, a lot of bruises. With baseball here, what you have is you have a lot of what we call the chronic injuries. You know, you have the, uh, the tendonitis, uh, the inflama inflammation on the rotator cuff, sometimes muscular injuries, things that take a long time to, you know, to develop. And unfortunately, you know, we don't have much time, especially when we're in the middle of a competition and we're competing for, you know, for a conference championship and playoffs. So that's uh, my job is to get them and my staff's job is to get them ready as soon as possible. A lot of treatment, a lot of rehabilitation, more of a preventive type of thing. We always want to make sure that uh, uh, we educate our kids as to the uh, the preparation. That's it's important to have a good pre-game and post-game uh, follow-up preparation. You know, make sure that they they heat up, they stretch, they get their proper treatment before before uh, going on the field, and make sure that they ice afterwards. Specifically, baseball pitchers. You know, they got to really take good care of their arms, and their coaching staff and, and combined with us, we do a really good job of that. I think athletes in general are in a hurry to get back uh, sooner than they should. Uh, I can understand some of the some of the circumstances. You know, you got playoffs. You have to think differently when you're in the playoffs. You know, you don't have much time to recover in the regular season. You know, you have a little bit more of a cushion. Uh, another thing is always, like I said, the nutritional aspect of it is very important. Some kids, unfortunately, uh, don't uh, eat like athletes, and that's something that you got to we got to emphasize. You know, that make sure that if you're an athlete, you got to. Treat your body differently than the average person, you know, in the population. You, know, you got to eat like an athlete. You got to rest, get your rest, get your pregame routine. Develop a routine, a good routine to warm up, uh, get warmed up, uh, get your flexibility, and uh, more of a preventive type. You don't want an injury to occur. You want to prevent them from occurring. Hydration, hydration, hydration. It is our number one priority. I mean, we want to make sure. And we do a doggone good job of that. We want to make sure every one of the teams that is practicing uh, has a tremendous amount of water, ice, uh, you know, proper hydration. So no athlete here goes, you know, without, you know, the, the proper, you know, hydration. And, and, and that's something that is not even, uh, not even an issue. Everyone, we, we emphasize that quite strongly. I think it's very important for our athletes to have hydration. And, you know, the thing is, hydration begins you know, before you come to the ballpark. It's the day before, you know, or, or the morning of the game, making sure you eat something that's good for you, good carbo, a good balance, you know, with, with, with carbohydrates, nothing greasy, nothing fat, you know, something that that's gonna, it gives you fuel to utilize for the contest. We're joined in the studio by two orthopedic surgeons, Dr. Job and Dr. Syed of the Loma Linda University Medical Center. In the video, Mike was talking about a little bit about prevention, but also about the process of escalation. I'm going to characterize it as you evaluate it in the field, and then I imagine for a child that's injured, um, Hassan, you were talking about various levels of injury and the 98% recovery rate. Uh, for those injuries, a kid with swelling and bruising might then go to urgent care or might go to their pediatrician, and eventually a referral to an orthopedic surgeon such as yourself. Is that the typical process, or do we need to push more training at the field, or are sports therapists that are at these games now for youths uh, adequately trained to assess these injuries in real time? I would say a well-trained sports trainer is uh, invaluable, and they actually can tell red flags for injuries uh, where they need immediate attention versus ones that can be treated conservatively with the simple therapies like ice, anti-inflammatories, and rest. Um, so at the college level, high school level, and beyond, most trainers have a pretty good background. Um, the word of caution I would throw out is if something is not improving um, and has, at least has a trend of improvement within a week and there's persistent symptoms, that should sort of uh, signal to the parents or even to the child athlete that I need to ask more questions or have myself checked out because there are things where if you catch sooner than later you can do more for and make it have a better outcome. How late is too late? It really depends on what you're dealing with. Uh, for instance, if there's a stress fracture, um, it may start out with a pain that occurs, um, for instance, say a runner and the, uh, that they'll describe as shin splints. 
Um, however, if the pain is to a point where even walking becomes painful, it may have crossed that threshold from being just simple shin splint to actually being a stress fracture. And the risk there is that bone can actually break and then require surgery. And then all of a sudden you've opened a new realm of recovery and uh, what goes with it. I'd like to go down kind of a list of injuries for our viewers that have kids playing various sports uh, so that they can familiarize themselves with some of the nomenclature and some of the potential injuries. Um, I'm going to start, though, with a story I know of, and that is we were talking about baseball pitchers. And um, Dr. Job, tell me about your father and his being honored at the Hall of Fame. Um, in about 1974, Tommy John, who was a pitcher uh, for many years, um, tore a ligament in his elbow, and this had never been reconstructed. And apparently this is a, this is a very common injury for uh, pitchers and some javelin throwers. It's pretty uh, restricted to that population because they need that ligament to do what they do. And uh, my father and uh, Tommy John decided that they were going to undertake this uh, reconstruction of Tommy's arm and he was the perfect patient to do it on because he he worked with a physical therapist and a trainer and came back. He actually won more games after he had had his elbow reconstructed than he had won before he had uh, had it reconstructed. And so this has probably been done on thousands of baseball pitchers now. And he was the first one to do it. He was the first one to do it. And there's a rumor out there that if you get the Tommy John, you come back and you're even faster. But if you look at what Tommy John did is that he was working with a trainer, or a physical therapist, and then a trainer, and then a, a pitching coach. And that's what people do after the surgery. It takes a year to come back. And maybe it has nothing to do with the surgery, but the fact that you actually paid attention to the pitching coach and that maybe if you did this before you injured your elbow, you, you wouldn't injure your elbow, and you would be a faster um, pitcher. If, if you look at the movies of people throwing the fastball or curveball or whatever, the guys that have the fastest arm often have the best style and are less likely to injure themselves. I'm going to jump to a question from Christy of Grand Terrace. And the question is, what do you do if your child isn't covered by health insurance? In terms of an injury occurring? Yes. Uh, I would. If I it, mean, I, I imagine you're expensive. You do uh, very good work. <laughs> I think, at least in the state of California, all children will get covered by health care. So as long as a, a child has an injury, they can present to an emergency room urgent care and at least start the process and get covered. So at least within our state, we have a system to protect their kids. And if there is something concerning, I wouldn't let that fear prevent them from moving forward. Okay, so even with no coverage, take the child to the emergency room and start that process of the referrals and the evaluation. Don't just sit at home and wait, especially as you say, if it's not getting better over the course of a week. Right, because eventually, if it is something that needs treatment, they will get treated. Uh, why not just start the process earlier? Okay, let's go down some of the common injuries that occur. First, <coughs> kids receive abrasions all the time. An abrasion is, is a superficial loss of skin. It's sort of like the, the opposite of a skin graft. And that and a blister they're like a second degree burn. And so it's gonna take you about three weeks to heal that in. So you, you want it to be blister or the, the abrasion to be clean, clean water, and keep it clean and dry and let it heal in. You have to rest it. And it takes about three weeks to heal a second degree burn. I wanna to go to a, a next one, ankle sprains. People say they've sprained their ankle all the time. What is an ankle sprain and how is that different than say a, a more severe injury? So an ankle sprain is basically a partial tear of a ligament. That's what most people have. It can range from being a little bit torn to completely torn. Um, so when they usually occur, that's usually the end of the spectrum they'll start. It's a partial tear. What happens is the ligament 
doesn't act like a rubber band. It doesn't go back to the same length it was before the injury. Um, it will heal somewhat lengthened. And so somebody who's had a bad ankle sprain is sort of at risk for another one. Um, and so when does it become something you have to worry about is if you are getting them all the time and your ankle is starting to feel less and less stable. The big one, how about ACL tears? So things to know about the ACL. Uh, they happen with knee injuries when the knee bends in different positions and the ligament can no longer support the knee. Uh, it happens commonly in football, but it can happen in almost any sport. I think uh, we've seen it happen in practically every sport, whether it's a uh, football injury, basketball injury, to you and baseball pitchers or softball players swinging a bat and having their foot planted. Things to watch for, uh, half the time people will feel a pop. And immediately after the pop, within one to two hours, the knee will swell up like a grapefruit. If that happens, I would not simply uh, put that off as a sprain. That needs to be checked out. Um, what happens afterwards is once the swelling comes down, if the knee feels loose and stable, especially when you're trying to turn and twist, that's another common finding that should have somebody go and get themselves checked out. How bad is an ACL injury? It's pretty bad. It requires surgery every time, does it not? Uh, well, the old rule used to be that everybody under the th age of 30 needed a surgery, and everybody over the age of 30 who had instability symptoms needed a surgery, but really 50 is the new 30. <laughs> I'm going to jump out, and first I'm going to take a tweet question. Uh, hashtag KVCR gets your <coughs> questions to us. Uh, my 13-year-old daughter wants to play football, but she's small for her age. Can you give me anything I can use? health or injury wise to discourage her. So this is somebody who really doesn't want their undersized 13 year old to be so uh, enthusiastic to play. <laughs> that's a tough question because um, that's sort of saying that an injury will occur. Part of it depends on what position she wants to play. If she's playing a position such as a place kicker, a field goal kicker, I wouldn't discourage her. If she's playing on the defensive side or on the line, um, then I would say she's at a higher risk if she's undersized just by the very nature of the physics involved of trying to protect your quarterback or being pushed over. Um, if she's 13, that means she's getting close to being done growing, but uh, her growth plates may still be open. So in addition to knee injuries, there may be injuries to the growth plate itself. So um, it really depends on what the goals are there. All right, and we have a caller. So I'm going to jump out from Grand Terrace. Caller is Randy. You're on the air. What's your question? Yeah, um, my daughter, 14-year-old daughter, played freshman, soc freshman soccer, and um, she just had an ACL operation. And um, I just wonder what the, the um, time for recovery and how she should treat that recovery, you know? That's a perfect question just because of what we had talked about earlier. Um, because I'm almost sure that her surgery was done arthroscopically, she will be feeling better in about a month, if not sooner. And in fact, her knee's gonna feel stable. It's gonna feel like it's ready to go in probably six weeks. And that sort of raises the conundrum. The knee feels ready to go, but the biology hasn't caught up. The ligament itself, and we've got pretty good studies showing us this, takes about nine months in order to really come back to reasonable strength and about 12 months to really become her own. So my advice to her and sort of what she can expect is for the first six to 12 weeks, simply live life in the straight line. So don't turn or twist, wear the brace like the surgeon recommends and really adhere to the physical therapy protocol. From month three to month nine after surgery, um, just sort of picture inside your knee that that ligament is at its weakest point. Even though it feels good, it's a dead ligament that isn't the bodies and uh, so almost every day remind yourself about that because when we see people go back to sports at six months there is a much much higher risk of re-rupture. By month 9 to 12 you can get back into your sports specific activities in her case soccer that will mean running around the cones doing side to side type activities but sort of big picture wise expect that it'll take about two years to really have that knee feel like it was never injured. So you're giving a heavy dose of, in this case, 
bad news to somebody that feels like in six weeks they're going to be back playing. Right. How many kids or parents ignore your advice? Too many. Too many. <laughs> we, well, actually, that's been brought up in discussion of surgeons is that the problem with the operation is we don't hurt the patient enough, and so they get careless with it. They think, oh, it feels great. And you've got to emphasize, let it heal. In this case, let it actually become part of the normal bodies. Right, and the final thing I would mention to that caller is um, make sure they know what graft was used and sort of what Dr. Job was alluding to. What we found that people under 30 who have ACL surgery, um, if you use your own tissues compared to if you use allograft, which is cadaver tissues that have been sterilized, People who have cadaver tissues tend to have a higher risk of re-rupture, meaning re-tearing that graft. And I think a lot of the thought is, um, is it the biology of the graft or is it that, you know, as a young active person, you don't hurt and you feel good and you use it too soon. What you're really doing from the third month to the nine month is you're building your muscles and your agility so that you can protect yourself. Because when you're on the playing field, you're not thinking about your knee. You're thinking about where the ball's going and who's running toward you. And between three and nine months, you're in controlled situations, building muscles and building agility where you're thinking about your knee. Okay, I'm going to jump to another call. Dale from San Bernardino. Uh, you're on the air. What's your question? We'll give Dale a second. Dale, you there? I'm here. All right. Um, I want to ask a question about football players. Uh, ha hairline fractures uh, in the bone, it, that's something, it, it, does that happen with the football players? Like, like, the, like the guy with the ball. He seemed to get knocked down pretty hard. Good question. Hairline fractures. So what I would tell you is a hairline fracture is a fracture and I sometimes worry that the word hairline kind of yeah, makes it sound no big deal exactly and so a hairline fracture the good news is most hairline fractures we can let the body really try to heal it because everything is lined up and it's just simply a break without any movement of the bone but uh, the reality is it's got to be treated like any fracture, which, you give, which means giving it the appropriate amount of time so it can heal and solidify. If you go too fast, you've made your hairline fracture a displaced fracture, meaning whatever bone it was that you're trying to heal, now not only is it broken, it's moved apart, and then you go into the OR. The caller, Dale, I think what he also he was getting at is, do you notice it as readily? Does it get the same degree of swelling and, and you know, that feeling, that tingling feeling where you can't put weight on that bone any longer because it's cracked. Um, do you get that in a hairline fracture? I, I, no. Yes. Or well, you, you have activity-related pain, and it seems to be getting worse. If you bring it in too early, it might not show on an X-ray. But if it's been more than a few weeks, the body has time to react to that stress fracture, and there's sort of a thickening of the bone. The, the body's trying to heal it and you're not letting it heal. So you can see this attempt to heal and that's how we spot it on the x-ray. You may not sp spot it if it's only a week old. And so yeah, it's not, <coughs> I, I, I see the question there. Yeah, it may not be easy to spot because take for instance that injury that occurred to uh, the uh, Louisville player this weekend, a fracture that shifts and comes through the skin, of course it's going to get your attention. A hairline fracture may not because one, it doesn't show up on the x-ray, and two, you're still functional. But this is sort of where it really becomes important to listen to yourself because if something is hurting and hurting beyond a few days and it's getting worse or not better, then if you don't listen to yourself or your body, you may ignore it. So let me contrast that watching your own body for that week with, say, people that displace their joints. Um, I haven't personally seen shoulder, but I've seen an awful lot of fingers, volleyball, those kinds of things. So you know, toes sometimes, you'll get them popped out, and then uh, a coach or somebody will just literally pull and pop it back in, and that actually works. There's bruising, swelling, discoloration, but you know, after a little bit, it goes away. It's fine. So. I mean, it's a good thing to put it back in. I, 
you know, for the most part, that's fine. It's afterwards making sure not to say, I can get back right away without having it checked out. Yeah, is a displaced joint always accompanied by some kind of a ligament tear or a tendon tear? Yes. The answer is uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I think in the people over 45 that dislocate the shoulder, we think it's a rotator cuff tear, but on anybody else, there is disruption of, of ligaments. And uh, a broken bone will be pain free if you hold it still. A dislocated joint is agonizingly painful until it's reduced. And that's why the coach comes out and he does that. So now you have a joint that's no longer dislocated, but you still have all the ligament problems and you probably need to have that checked out. Okay, I hear the word meniscus. Tell me what that is. So the meniscus is a structure within the knee. It's made out of a different type of cartilage. And in simple terms, it's basically the cushion to the cartilage above and below on the knee surface joint. And um, it's a structure that gets commonly injured with the twisting motion. So heads, we see it with ACL injuries, we'll see it isolated. And it can happen on the inner side, which is called the medial meniscus, or it can happen on the lateral side. So if its job is to protect the cartilage and you've got that structure torn, especially as somebody who's a young athlete, then you really want to give it proper attention. Um, the symptoms people feel are twisti with twisting and turning. They'll get a sharp pain right at the joint line or in scenarios where it's torn and actually pushed apart, it will keep the knee from coming fully straight or somebody has to actually wiggle their knee to get it so that they can get their motion back. If that's occurring, then again, another red flag, come into the orthopedic surgeon's office as soon as you can. And in young people, we can actually get them to heal a young person with a, a longitudinal ligament near the blood supply. Uh, so it's, it's worth having somebody look in there and it may prevent you developing arthritis 20 years later. Tell me about that. That's a common, uh, is, it a, is it a myth or a wives tale or is it very true that if you've injured something in your youth that later you'll develop a higher degree of arthritis? It's very common. That's why people are working so hard on the anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction because it happens so often in the military and then five, ten years later, people were in the veterans' hospitals with bad arthritis. Um, the lateral meniscus is especially important as a load-sharing device because the, the lateral side of our knee doesn't really conform very well. And if you take out the lateral meniscus, you have to take it out, the pressure, the stress on that part of the knee is 235% of normal. So you have this accelerated wearing out of the knee. And so it is very common for people to have a meniscectomy and then 20 years later they're there for the knee replacement. Yeah, I was going to say, don't they have just a rubber washer they can just pop in these days? I wish. <laughs> That's, that would be nice. Um, there's, in really rare cases, we will put in a cadaver meniscus um, to sort of take the function of a meniscus that can't be repaired or is so torn that it's beyond salvage. But uh, synthetic materials, we're still working on them in the lab, and they're still at least five to ten years from being feasible. When are we going to be bionic? Uh, <laughs> as soon as we can get that thing to work, I guess. Okay, so we've covered a lot of different injuries. We've talked about the repercussions, for instance, of overuse, uh, pitchers, curve balls that are more damaging, and improper form, improper style as contributory. And I especially liked your point, Chris, about the pitching coaches in the rehab phase uh, actually contributing to better performance. It may have nothing to do with the surgery or the procedure the person received. Correct. Right. We'd like so, to take the credit. Mm, but. Yeah. So mm, give me any last thought briefly. Should parents be cautious or go ahead and have their kid play competitively? Well, my message is sort of going to echo Dr. Job's. It's good to be active. That we, I don't want to scare anyone from being active, but have fun and listen to your body. I'm going to cut you off there. I'd like to thank our guests, Drs. Christopher Job and Hassan Syed of the Loma Linda University Medical Center. Next week, we'll be examining the challenges faced by those seeking a career in the arts. I'm Roger Bowman, and thank you for watching Plugged Inland.